So my topic tonight, um, the title of my talk anyway, is uh, really dismantling the Big Bang. I think in your notes, um, there was, uh, we've slightly changed the talk title, but the content is pretty much the same. I'm speaking about cosmology. Now you don't need to get too worried about this. Cosmology is really just the way we think about the universe, about its structure and its origin. In modern times, this subject has become pretty much totally dominated by secular beliefs, especially the Big Bang. I think you must agree with me that from mainstream media, you should think, or you should get the impression, that the Big Bang has pretty well explained everything, even the origin of the universe, its structure, and all those sort of things. So this is my topic, and I'm speaking here tonight on behalf of Creation Ministries International, which is a uh, volunteer, well, I'm speaking as a volunteer. I have a real job, actually, at the University of Western Australia, uh, where I'm a physicist. But um, I'm speaking for this ministry. The ministry uh, you may have known previously under the name of Answers in Genesis. We changed our name last year sometime. It's non-denominational non-profit, and it's about supplying the church with resources and materials to answer the skeptic, but I think even more importantly, the truth seeker in this uh, modern generation. They, they call it the age of science, you know. I hope you can see this. Um, this is a picture of the Hubble Deep Field South. It's a, a picture of the sky taken with the Hubble Space Telescope and the European Space Agency VLT. It's a combined image. The VLT simply means very large telescope, you know. <laughs> Astronomers don't have a really great sense of imagination. But, oh, I'm sorry, if there's any astronomers in the room, you know, that was just a joke, I don't really mean that. Um, so they combine these images and the, and the, and the photograph essentially is is taken of about a billionth of the sky area, something like the size of the moon. Um, very long exposure, probably more than 100 hours over about 10 days or something like that. And this image shows some of the very distant galaxies in our universe. The idea being here, the Big Bang tells us, or the Big Bang model tells us that it's alleged that in the early universe, matter pours out of this Big Bang hydrogen gas largely, and from that you get the formation of stars and galaxies. Therefore, the idea is they start out like proto-galaxies, baby galaxies in their infancy, simple, and over a period of time building complexity and structure until they become larger galaxies and more complex, like the ones we see around us. The problem is that in this image, that over 50% of those galaxies are the type of galaxies we see around us today, what we would call mature galaxies, like spiral galaxies and so on of this type. And this is a real problem to explain for the Big Bang cosmologists how do galaxies form so quickly in the early universe. And maybe this is that cosmologist there on the right, he really just does not know, he can't explain this. And perhaps he is Stephen Hawking, the chap on the left, the famous astrophysicist, cosmologist, um, Oxford professor. He's written a few books, and possibly some of you have read his books. Anyone read A Brief History of Time? A few of you have read that book? In there, and also in a book he published later in 2002, uh, a book called a Theory of Everything, which one might think that you would have the answers to a lot of important questions in such a book with a title like that. He states in both books that we still don't understand the origin of stars and galaxies. Think about that for a minute. This universe, and we don't understand how stars and galaxies formed naturalistically, then it means we really don't know so much about the universe. So much is still unexplained, even the basic stuff. You see, we need to learn to rediscover the universe or to rediscover how to think about the universe in really the only way that makes any sense, and that's from God's perspective, in the light of the history that he has written in his word. 
Many see this as the true history of our universe, starting with the Big Bang over here on the top right, following those red arrows. They see that the Big Bang exploded and radiation poured out, eventually matter formed, hydrogen gas, helium formed in the, during the Big Bang nuclear synthesis process. From that, stars formed a billion or so years after the Big Bang. Some of those stars exploded, spewed out dust into the intergalactic medium, and from the dust more, and gas, more stars formed and galaxies formed over a long time period. And eventually, out of some of that gas and dust, our solar system formed about five billion years ago. The sun condensed down and, and turned on. And then some half billion years later, one of these blobs of material on the side of this nebula formed into our Earth, which cooled down, and then oceans formed on the surface of the Earth. And some 3.8 billion years ago, some non-life-to-life -life episode occurred. And then over billions of years of Earth history, biological evolution took over, and eventually here we are. We're sitting here today. That's basically, in a sort of a nutshell, the Big Bang history that we're asked to believe. But I say we really we need to look at the Bible and read the Bible as the true history of the universe. Many Christians, however, have tried to reinterpret those early chapters of Genesis that gives the creation account. And they've done this in light of that Big Bang thinking, that history that I just gave you. The framework hypothesis, the first one over here, it says essentially those early chapters don't actually have any narrative, any actual history in them at all. They're just uh, um, stories that teach us good moral lessons, the important moral lessons that we need to know. The theistic evolution idea is that God just started off the Big Bang and that was it and had nothing much else to do. The rest was just through the, the processes of, of time uh, the laws of physics and random chance processes and God was not much involved in anything else. All the long ages, geologic ages, the biology, the, the um, evolution, all this occurred but God just started it off in the beginning. That sounds to me like a very impotent God, one that didn't have much to do with anything. And then the day age idea, that idea is to expand out the length of time in, in Genesis chapter 1 by reinterpreting the meaning of the word yom, the Hebrew word yom, which we translate as day. And it's true that the word yom could be translated as a long period of time, just like the expression in my father's day or in the day of the Lord. But in the text of Genesis, the writer clearly writes it as a narrative, as history, as a 24 hour earth rotation day. The day age people, wish to expand that out to very long periods of time, millions of years, billions of years, and therefore stretch out the timeline to fit in with that Big Bang idea of billions of years of history. The gap theory, they do something a little different. They insert billions of years in between the first two verses of Genesis chapter 1, verses 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 and 1, 2, to place billions of years of Earth history of the, the geologic history of this planet where animals died, went extinct and so on, new animals evolved, and it just looks like um, th what we see in the, the biological record, we see these, all these sediments you know, in the, laid down in the earth, and they say that during that period, those sediments were laid down by Lucifer's flood, some flood that the Bible makes no mention of, and yet it, refer, <coughs> it refers to Genesis, sorry, it refers to Noah's flood and spends three whole chapters on Noah's flood. And certainly Noah's flood could have laid down all those sediments, all those fossil bearing sediments in a very short period of time, as um, the Bible tells us. And then finally, the idea of the progressive creation. The progressive creationists they accept the Big Bang, they accept that whole history of the universe, the, the billions of years history of our planet, but not biological evolution. They say over the billions of years of uh, the history of our planet, uh, one species went extinct and then God made another one to replace it. And over a sort of a progressive period of time, as one species went extinct, God created another. And so it only looks like in the fossil record that one evolved into another. but 
They say it was a progressive creation, you see, something like that. But all of these compromised positions, really, they're neither good science nor good theology. Because, let's look at this. The Big Bang cosmology requires a naturalistic explanation of origins. There's no creator. And the Bible, however, calls for a supernatural creator, a creator that created this universe with design and purpose. There is no naturalistic cause. So, but some have tried to take this supernatural creation and fit it into this Big Bang worldview. And I think if you attempt that, you'll find it just doesn't work. For this reason, Alex Williams and I have written this book, Dismantling the Big Bang, which you'll find up on the book tables. We've tried to bring this subject down to the Christian, to the lay Christian. We've tried to digest it and make it as easy to understand as possible. And I've, uh, I will admit here that um, everything that uh, I wrote that Alex Williams, who's a very good science writer, but everything I wrote that he couldn't understand, he rewrote. And so I must admit that actually Alex wrote the entire book. <laughs> it's true. This book will tell, us, tell you essentially what the Big Bang is about. It's saying that the universe created itself. It's a universe without God. And we try to expose the, both the scientific and the philosophical weaknesses in this type of thinking. And there are many contradictions in the Big Bang um, worldview. This book also will show you, it's not only pulling apart the Big Bang, but it's showing you the superiority of starting with the history in the Bible. We try to build a biblical cosmology. And I would add that Jesus Christ believed in the Genesis account and this should be the starting point for us all. If we start with the Bible, we can learn to think correctly about this world and about the cosmos. We don't start with what man says, but with what God says. And if the biblical account is changed to fit in with this um, naturalistic model, the Big Bang model, or, what, or any other naturalistic model, as all of those compromised positions attempt to do, then the true message of the Bible is lost. And I'll explain why. I think you would agree with me that the glory of God is revealed in his creation. This is a rather beautiful picture, isn't it? This one's just from Microsoft, so Bill Gates done something good. <laughs> but you know, isn't it, it's, a logically, it's logically absurd for us as Christians to worship God as creator, but then refuse to believe what he has to say on the subject of creation. And it goes to the heart of Christian doctrine because the atonement itself depends on the Genesis creation account. According to Genesis, man was created to live with God in this paradise forever. The original creation was perfect. It was a perfect paradise. Genesis 1 tells us at the end of that creation week when God had finished creating, he said it was very good. It was a perfect world. There was no death in that world. But if we are to believe this Big Bang scenario that I've described to you, which includes billions of years of Earth history, in which one animal evolved into another, that means dying and going extinct, forming all those fossil sediments we see in the layers of rocks, which contain all those dead things, it's a record of death and suffering and disease, if all of that happened for billions of years and then God created the Garden of Eden at the end of that, how could God have said it was very good? It doesn't make any sense, does it? And then think about this. The Bible also tells us that death only entered the, into the world as a result of Adam's sin. Death was the penalty for sin. Only because of man's actions did death enter the world. And as a, as a result of his sin, the whole creation was cursed. Some say, yeah, but that... That's, that penalty of sin, that curse, only was upon mankind. But if you look in Romans 8, it tells us that the whole creation is in bondage to decay. It's passed upon the whole universe. And, of course, it tells us also it's waiting for deliverance from this state. 
So you see, there's the whole message, but not quite, because Jesus, God then provide, provided that perfect sacrifice that only an infinite God can do, and he paid that penalty of sin, Jesus Christ himself, dying and rise, raising, rising again to, to redeem us, right? So evolution tells us, though, that there was these billions of years, three and a half or something billions of years of death and struggle and disease before man even came on the scene, because man wasn't supposed to have evolved to around about one or two million years ago. So death was around for a long time. But if death is indeed a natural part of life, which is what the evolutionist is telling us, then it cannot be the penalty for sin. You see, you cannot have death before sin and be consistent with the message, the whole message in, in the text. And then if we look in Revelations, it tells us that God, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death. You see, death is going to be removed. So the death, the death as a penalty of a sin was a real thing that was imposed upon man. It says there'll be neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. The curse is lifted. These former things are passed away. And then it goes on to say, in the midst of the heavenly city, there was the tree of life. Remember, there were two trees of some significance in the Garden of Eden, and one of them was the tree of life. And after Adam's sin, Adam and Eve, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden, so they couldn't partake of the fruit of the tree of life and live forever in their fallen states. The tree of life is going to be restored. It's a real tree. It's not a metaphor. It's not an allegory. It's not a story. If it's going to be restore, restored as a real tree, then the Garden of Eden was a real place, and it was a real tree back then. So God is going to restore the kingdom that he once created that was marred by the sin, and hence the, the curse. But the Bible also tells us there shall be no more curse. The curse will be lifted. So the complete balance, God is going to re restore his kingdom. So why dismantle the Big Bang? Well, let me put this in black and white, as they say. So this is my only black and white slide tonight. <laughs> if we accept the billions of years of history, beginning with the Big Bang, then that ultimately means, if you follow the logic through, that means death before sin. There's death before sin. And if that's the case, then the idea of Christ dying to make that payment for our sins becomes meaningless. You see, it undermines the whole message of the Bible. The gospel message and all is undermined. Now, I've been talking about the Big Bang. Well, what is the Big Bang? This is from uh, Discover magazine in 2002. It said the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada, and as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. <laughs> I'm not sure why you're laughing. That's a serious scientific comment. <laughs> this one's the joke here. The Big Bang. Let me get this straight. First there was nothing, then it exploded. <laughs> and seriously, well, I'm not so seriously, but Sir Fred Hoyle actually did name this the Big Bang in derision. He was on BBC Radio in the late 50s, and he was a believer in the steady state model at the time, a different cosmological model. And the commentator asked him, well, what do they believe? What does the opposition believe? And he said, ah, oh, some Big Bang or something like that. And so the name stuck. He, he pretty well christened it, and yet he wasn't a believer in it. The Big Bang, though, is a scientific model, and what I mean by that, it's a mathematical structure that attempts to describe the universe, the structure of the universe. And also, it, but it only calls on the laws of nature, or the laws of physics, time and chance. It attempts to not only give us the structure of the universe, but its origin and history, future history even. You must understand it's a it's a secular worldview. It's not just a theory, it's a construct, construct that's far larger than that. It's really a belief system, if you like. A belief system in which the researchers will take the facts and they will interpret those facts within that belief system. And you must understand that's what this is. The alternative is also a scientific model of the structure of the universe, also 
has a mathematical description of the structure. In this case, though, it calls on the creator, the biblical creator, and his created laws. The laws of nature or laws of physics are part of God's creation. They are his creation. And we expect it to operate under those laws. In this case, the model, or the, this, it's also a worldview, it must match the biblical account as described in, the, in that, uh, those early chapters of Genesis. So it, is, it should um, be based on and not be contradictory to the history as described in the Bible. But it is also a biblical, it is also a worldview, just a biblical worldview. And in this case, the same, the facts are the same for, um, for any, any researcher, whether he's an atheistic cosmologist or a, a biblical cosmologist, the facts are, are the same, the observations are the same. It's the interpretation of those observations that's important. This model also can explain the observations that we see in the universe, or we make in the universe. The facts are not generally in dispute. It's their interpretation. And we need to understand that there are two types of science. Most people are not familiar with this, but there's operational science or experimental science. It's the sort of science I do in my lab. I'm a, a clockmaker. I build sapphire clocks. Besides moonlighting as a cosmologist, I spend a lot of time in the lab building a cryogenic sapphire oscillator based on a large piece of sapphire. This is cooled to about minus 268 degrees below zero, and it's the most stable, precise clock ever built by anybody in the whole universe. Your watch on your wrist, if you have a quartz watch like mine, probably gain or lose a second in a, in a week, if it's a really good one. My clock will gain or lose a second in about 100 million years. So very stable, very precise. And it's used for testing relativity, for testing fundamental physics in our labs. Those type of things, if I, from day in and day out, if I repeat my experiments, I expect to get the same results. This is operational science. Same sort of science that built this laptop or develops jumbo jets or modern medicines. These are a repeatable science. If we're applying this to the cosmos, it might mean things like measuring the motions of stars or planets or, or galaxies, things that we can repeat from day to day. And then there's also historical science, which is much weaker. This type of science attempts to construct stories about the origin of objects in the cosmos, or in general indeed. And, but in the cosmos, it might be to do with the origin of the universe itself, to do with the origin of stars and galaxies. Often these things are unobservable. In fact, it's about constructing a story about the unobserved past. So it's much weaker. It's really a, a history, a, a sort of a, it's really an endeavor to discover the true history of this universe. And maybe it's not even a science issue, but a hist historical history issue. But these are the two histories that we are presented with, or I'm presenting to you tonight. One is the, the Big Bang worldview, with this history beginning nowadays, they say around about 13.7 billion years ago, there was this Big Bang, you see radiation pouring out, then eventually the formation of a lot of hydrogen gas, some helium too, about a quarter helium built up, and then after a few billion years later, you have the formation of stars and galaxies. This goes through a long process over billions of years, and around about five billion years ago, you get the formation of our sun, condensing out of dust and, and gases that were swirling around in space, and eventually from this nebula that I showed you earlier, you get uh, the formation of our planet Earth starts to cool off, initially from molten blob, it cools off, and eventually cools off enough that you get the formation of seas. And in some uh, pond or sea or something, they, they say there was some non-life-to-life episode occurred, and then biological evolution starts up, and then over the subsequent billions of years, we get building more complex plants and animals, and eventually humans evolved um, around about somewhere between one or two billion year, a million years ago. And then the account from the Bible, the Genesis chapter 1, it says God started out with water, a whole mess of water, and at some point God's spirit moved on that, on that water, energized the water, and 
formed a, a, the earth, a ball of water. And at some point there, he says he separated the waters from the waters, the waters below, he formed dry land, and that was on day three. And then he, he created the fruit trees and grasses and vegetation and things like that. On day four, he created the sun and the moon and all the stars in the cosmos. That, of course, including the planets and so on, this sort of thing. On day five, he creates the birds all the flying things, including some flying reptiles there, like Rampharynchus and Pteranodon and those sort of things. And then he created, on the same day, the marine creatures, whales, fish, and um, marine dinosaurs, you know, like uh, Chronosaurus and Plesiosaur and those sort of things. Day six, he creates all the air-breathing land animals, including uh, T-Rex and the dinosaurs, and of course, man on, on day six. Now, these are two different histories, two different worldviews, if you like. We are told by some that this biblical account here is merely only a description of what really happened, the Big Bang. In other words, it's an allegorical description, a poetical description, if you like. But you can't make these fit together, even if you talk about expanding the time scale. Because you see, in the Big Bang, the sun comes before the earth. But in the creation account, the earth comes before the sun. They're out of sequence. Um, in the creation account, birds are created on day five, reptiles created, land reptiles created on day six. The evolution story tells us that uh, reptiles evolved into birds. Again, that's out of sequence. Plants, for example, were created on day three, but um, evolutionists tell us that plants and animals over here in this somewhere down the line and evolution sort of evolved fairly um, closely together. But the creation account separates the creation of plants from animals, plants well before animals, this sort of thing. So there's many things out of sequence and if you look at that you can see there are many, many more differences. And another problem is the timelines. This is the Genesis timeline if you add up the uh, genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, you can get a history that's something of the order of 6,000 years, give or take a bit. Then you look at that and you realize that all of the elements of the universe were created in those first six days that I just outlined to you. And, and make note that man was created on day six. Day six, therefore, is right here at the beginning of creation, at the beginning of that creation timeline. The uh, Big Bang timeline is very different. They say we have the Big Bang here about 13.7 billion years ago, and then from that, all this matter pours out of the Big Bang, initially hydrogen that forms stars, and then galaxies, some of those stars explode, supernova. In those stars, it builds up, builds up all the elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the things that you and I are made of. And also, in the exploding stars, right up to uranium, all the heavy elements are supposed to be formed. And eventually, some nebula starts to form out of this gas and dust around five billion years ago, and our sun condenses, and eventually the Earth forms from some of that material. And then, at some point, as I mentioned, biological evolution starts up some non-life to life thing. So you see, it starts out with hydrogen and through that process, through the stardust building up the heavy elements, those are the elements that you and I are made of. And they say we evolve from the earth. So they say that you and I are not much more than highly evolved stardust. You see that? See that whole story there? But man came on the scene around here a couple of a million years or so ago. So really, if we're talking about creating man here on this timeline, it would be at the end of creation, not at the beginning, because it's a long, long way away from that 13 billion year ago beginning in the Big Bang. But Jesus said in Mark 10:6, when he was talking about the institution of marriage, he said, but from the beginning of the creation, the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. So at, that was at the beginning of creation. If the Big Bang is true, Jesus should have said at the end of creation, because it certainly wasn't at the beginning of creation. And if Jesus is creator, are we going to believe his words as real history? 
I certainly think we should. He referred to Genesis many times as real history. He quoted it on numerous occasions. And another problem is the science continually changes. This university professor tells his new students, you know, like at the start of a new lecture course, the first thing he says to them, fully 80% of the stuff you learn at university is wrong. The trouble is we don't know which 80%. <laughs> See, the lesson is if you hang your theology on man's opinion, on man's science, which is continually changing instead of on God's word, what do you do when the science changes? And this has happened. Uh, this has happened many times. The uh, progressive creationist, Dr. Hugh Ross of the Reason to Believe Ministry, he's hanging his theology on the Big Bang, that this is the correct description, that, that he, he claims that that's a literal reading of Genesis. I don't see how he gets it, but he makes that claim. And those billions of years of Earth history is a literal reading of Genesis. But what happens when man changes his opinion, when the science changes? Besides, before geologists like um, James Hutton and Charles Lyell in the late 1800s, before they started to speculate that the earth was indeed very old, like 4.6 billion years old, Christians at the time generally accepted the biblical timeline, that 6,000 years or whatever it was up to that time. And then after these guys, along came Charles Darwin. He took Lyell's works on the Beagle, traveled around on that that holiday around South America for five years where he formulated his ideas on biological evolution, we see he, he studied the long age ideas of these geologists. So after that, Christians were more inclined to accept the long ages, the long age of the earth and so on. See, long age, lo the long age res results you get really depend on your long age assumptions. It depends on where you start. The facts are not in doubt. It's the assumptions it's, that you start with that drive the interpretation. If you start with naturalistic assumptions, you get naturalistic conclusions. It critically depends on your starting assumptions. And the following is an example of this. And I think possibly this is one of the biggest problems that creationists have ever faced. I generally accept that the cosmos is truly large. I really have no problem with that. That indeed the universe is, is billions of light years in size. And what that means at constant speed of light today, which is very fast as we know, that light should take billions of years to travel across the cosmos. That's what you would think on the surface. In other words, that's, light year is a distance. It's an enormous distance. So people cannot understand how if the universe is so large and it takes light so long to travel across the universe, how do we see stars? Because the biblical timeline tells us the universe is only about 6,000 years old. And many have tried to use this as justification to reinterpret that biblical history that I've been showing to you. Let me explain this a bit more. Here's a nice picture here from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's, um, it's actually the brightest um, stellar explosion ever seen in modern times. It's a supernova. A star exploded here at the center of this ring and we first saw it in 1987. This uh, this star, or this exploding star, this supernova, is located in a nearby galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And that is about 170,000 light years from Earth. We saw this object, we saw this, this uh, explosion, and this explosion carried to Earth from that large Magellanic Cloud carries information. It carries the picture of that explosion and so on. On the surface, it looks like it should take 170,000 years to get to Earth. So how can we see it if God created everything only six or so thousand years ago? It doesn't make any sense, does it? You see, the problem is, what if the, there was an explosion, a, a supernova in the nearby Andromeda galaxy, which is two and a half million light years away. 
So that should take two and a half million years to get to Earth. You see the problem? How do we see stars? How did Adam see stars? How do we see them if, 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 if that's, that's the case? Well, you've got your first equation here for tonight. Didn't know you were going to get equations tonight, did you? But this is pretty simple. Everyone knows this. The time to travel somewhere is equal to the distance divided by the speed you're travelling. So if you're travelling at uh, um, 50 kilometres an hour, over 100 kilometres, it takes you two hours. And I know the young people here would get there in one hour. That's right. No? <laughs> but let's, let's presume that the distances in the universe are correct. And I really have no reason to doubt that that's not the case. Also, let's assume the speed of light is a constant. And also, I have no reason to doubt that it's not constant and it hasn't been constant. It certainly hasn't varied very much. What is left in the equation then? The only variable left is time. And I say that's where we should look for the answer. Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that time is not an absolute. We are so used to, in our experience, thinking that time flows the same for everybody, everywhere. And on Earth, generally, that is the case. But I'm involved with time. I build clocks. I work with international agencies. I work, I work with atomic clocks. And I know that time is not an absolute. Did you know that the GPS satellites, which are at an altitude of about 20,000 kilometers, they have an atomic clock on them, a cesium atomic clock. And if you compare the rate at which they tick, and I say that in inverted commas because they don't really tick, but they measure time, they tick essentially 38 microseconds faster than an equivalent clock would, be, would do on Earth. So the time at the level of that satellite flows faster than it does on the surface of the Earth. Time is not an absolute in the universe. Time flows and can be warped and bent. We know this from relativity and it depends on the, the observer, his motion, his circumstances, his gravitational field. I suggest that this is a clue, a hint, to a solution to this problem. So I propose this, that during creation week, and remember during creation week, God is the creator. He's sovereign. He can do what he likes. He created the laws of nature. What if one day could have passed on Earth while billions of years passed in the cosmos? See, this is a time dilation thing, where more time is available in the cosmos than is on Earth. A normal 24-hour Earth rotation day, yet billions of years could pass in the cosmos. I have a theory, a fully general relativistic theory, that can explain this, how such a process could occur. And the idea is that the clocks on Earth during creation day four were ticking, say, a trillion times slower than the clocks in the cosmos. These are these are sort of uh, ideal clocks, if you think like that, because they measure time, the rate at which time flows on other galaxies in the cosmos. So during creation week, because the clocks were ticking very slow, that means there's millions, even billions of years of astronomical time available in the cosmos. And light can travel through the universe from any star or galaxy and arrive not all the way, but some of the distance, and then at the end of creation day, when this effect stops, the light just continues to travel to Earth. The Bible also tells us that when God spoke, he created out of nothing. God is sovereign. He can create out of nothing. He creates matter. And it also tells us in Isaiah and other places in the Bible, and there's similar expressions to this, he says, my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they stand up together. There's other expressions like stretched it out like a curtain or spread out the heavens like a tent. The idea being that the fabric of space itself in which stars and galaxies embedded is not nothing. It's a substance. It's something. And God rapidly stretched out that fabric during that initial creation day four. And we see that accelerating that, that, sorry, that expanding universe where God stretched it out. But during that initial creation process, at some point there, 
God rapidly stretched it out, and this process caused clocks on Earth to run slow compared to clocks in the cosmos. So you can get these billions of years in the cosmos, whereas only one 24-hour Earth rotation day passes on Earth. So this is sort of a summary of that idea. Our galaxy then needs to be at the centre of the physical universe because all the other galaxies are dragged away by God in some supernatural rapid expansion of this fabric of space. And cosmic clocks run at what I call them normal speed, normal compared to now, whereas creation on, on Earth during creation day four, they ran very, very slow. And then God stopped that process and all clocks in the universe, both Earth and in the cosmos, all run at the same rate. So that would then allow plenty of time for the light to travel here, and yet we can still say the universe is only 6,000 years old, but by Earth clocks. You have to then add by whose clocks. So if anyone ever asks you that, always add, yes, but by whose clocks? Because if you measure it by Earth clocks, it's 6,000 years, but you measure objects in the universe, they could be billions of years old by astronomical clocks. And so there's a difference. Time is not an absolute. So I have explained to you a solution to that problem, but it's based on biblical assumptions that the history in the Bible is true. The Big Bang also has a number of very key and important assumptions. And one of them is that the Big Bang begins in a singularity. A singularity is a state where all matter, energy, space and time are crushed into a single point, sort of a point of infinite density something difficult to comprehend. But all Big Bang cosmologies begin after the universe begins expanding. They don't know how to begin it. They don't know how it started off because that's a very stable state that the universe should just stay in forever. And this is a very big problem, but to a biblical creationist, it's not because we have the creator. The creator is in our cosmology, in our worldview and God created the universe as he described in the Bible. So how did the universe begin? Well, this is a problem to the cosmologist. And recently, um, Stephen Hawking, who I mentioned earlier, the Oxford professor, they say is one of the smartest man, men on earth, he published an article in Nature magazine, and this is uh, reported. He asked a couple of important questions. One of them was, how did the universe begin? And many scientists would regard this as one of the most profound questions of all. I agree, it is. It absolutely is. But in the paper, now you must understand Stephen Hawking's an atheist. He totally rejects the biblical history. In fact, his wife of 30 years was a Christian who tried to witness him to him and bring him to the Lord, but he threw her out. He utterly rejected the Lord. Now this question, how did the universe begin, to Stephen Hawking, he says, the question doesn't even exist. In other words, you're not allowed to even ask that question, how did the universe begin? Because you see, this is the massive problem. And he goes on to say, he is claiming that the universe has no unique beginning. Instead, it began in just about every way imaginable, and maybe even some that aren't. So he's actually saying there is no unique history, no unique beginning to the universe. It began all types of ways, even those unimaginable. We just sample some of those at our current epoch in time that it looks like this particular history. Now, what does that sound like to you? It's starting to sound like a, a faith position, right? A religious position. Now, that's not the, that's not the end of it. He then asked this other question. He says, why are we here? My goodness, he should have read the Bible and he could have found out why we are here. The Bible has answered these questions. You see, he says the theory also suggests an answer to the puzzle of why some of the constants of nature are finely tuned to a value that allows life to evolve. He believes we evolve, he believes in evolution. But there's a, a well-known uh, phenomena, it's called often the anthropic principle, 
where physicists have found that the constants of nature are so finely tuned, if you change some of the coupling constants of nuclear constants and atomic constants, matter would fly apart. Life could not possibly exist. And you know what they call this universe that's so finely tuned? You all know the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, right? And there was a bit of porridge involved, right? There were some porridge that was too hot, some porridge that was too cold, and then there was porridge that was what? Just right. So this universe is just right. So they call it the Goldilocks universe. He <laughs> goes on to say, if we start from where we are now, it is obvious that the current universe must select those histories that lead to these conditions, otherwise we simply wouldn't be here. So you see, the universe is now the hero. The universe did it. It created itself. It's really almost a belief like animism, that everything is alive. Everything has a conscience. He doesn't believe in God, and he will do anything to get around this problem. Now, the second assumption is that the universe is homogeneous. And this simply means that matter is spread out through the universe, on the larger scales anyway, it's spread out so that it's evenly distributed throughout the universe. No matter where you are, if you're an observer and you looked out around you, you should see roughly the same distribution of matter. It should look pretty much the same. This is an important assumption because these equations upon which the Big Bang model today is built, which was developed by Alexander Friedman and Georges Lemaitre, these equations down here, they require that the universe be homogeneous. This is a critical assumption. Those equations are invalid if the universe is not homogeneous. Of course, these equations are developed by these guys independently in the 1920s from Einstein's general theory of relativity. And just for homework, I'd like you to solve those equations and email me your results. <laughs> you will be graded for it. <laughs> now, what also happened in the 1920s, in fact, 1929, Edwin Hubble pub published his result that the universe was expanding. And what Ed Edwin Hubble had been doing was measuring the distances to nearby galaxies and measuring their redshift. The redshift is seen in the light coming from those galaxies, and uh, without going into a lot of detail, you can understand the, the redshift as the speed of the galaxy receding, ru uh, rushing away from us. But he found that wherever he looked, the galaxy's speed at which it was rushing away, or its redshift, was proportional to its distance. And this is in every direction in the sky. And if th you think about that for a minute, if you are located in such a place where there's a proportionality between the speed of the galaxy rushing away and its distance, then that indicates you're at the center of the physical universe. You think about that for a minute. Certainly Hubble realized this possibility, and he wrote in his book in 1937, he says, such a condition would imply we occupy a unique position in the universe but the unwelcome supposition of a favoured location must be avoided at all costs. Hubble was an atheist. He absolutely rejected the notion of the Genesis creation. He goes on to say a favoured position, of course, is intolerable. Moreover, it represents a discrepancy with the theory because the theory postulates homogeneity. There it is again, a homogeneous universe. In other words, it can't be right. We can't be at the center of the universe. It must be that only appears that we are because the universe is homogeneous. In other words, any observer anywhere should see the same sort of picture of the galaxies moving away. But if I could show to you evidence that the universe is not homogeneous, then how would the Big Bang model stand? It would be on very shaky ground. And in recent times, there have been two large surveys. This is our galaxy here. And if you can imagine, that's like a slice looking up and a slice looking down. So they've done surveys where they looked out in the universe and mapped all the galaxies in one direction, above and below the plane of our, of our, of our galaxy. And this is the results from one of those surveys. This is the 2D, two degree field survey. And we are here at the center. This is our galaxy at the center. And we're looking out in this direction, in two different directions. Each dot is a galaxy. 
the color is false, false coloring. So don't be distracted by that. But you see, can you see the circular kind of concentric structure there? On this side, it's much easier to see than over here. But it's there on both sides. So it's sort of saying we are at the center of a spherical distribution of galaxies. They're like at preferred distances. And here's another one, which may not be as easy to see, it may be worse, but up the top it's clearer to see the concentric rings of galaxies that prefer to pile up at a preferred distance. So the separation between those preferred distances is about 100 million light years. So that means we would have to be at the center of that distribution of galaxies. You know, if you can imagine like, like an onion, you cut an onion in half and you see all the rings and you're at the center, our galaxy at the center, then where the rings are is like where the galaxies prefer to pile up. That's called spherically symmetric or isotropic, isotropic but unique center, then it means the universe is not homogeneous. So there's some evidence. Now, remember I told you, I'm interpreting the evidence within the framework that I have. But it's fairly compelling evidence. I can't prove it exactly, and more work needs to be done on this. But I, it looks to me like we're in a special place in the universe. We're a special place in the galaxy. Where it's tuned, this universe is tuned to life, but also the galaxy seems to be in a special place in the universe, at the center of the physical universe. God says that mankind is at the center of his attention. Why not physically so we can see God's glory in the universe all around us? I know, you, I know I'm giving you a lot of facts, a lot of material, and I'm sure your brain's running hot trying to process it all. But here's a little bit more to, to throw in there as well. This is a galaxy here, and it has a fairly small redshift, redshift of 0 0.022. Now, if we interpret that as a speed of the galaxy moving away from us, that's about 2% of the speed of light. So it's quite significant. But according to the Hubble law, remember that law I showed you, greater the redshift, the greater the distance, that galaxy is at about 240 million light years away. On the scale of our universe, that's fairly close. It's a relatively close galaxy. In front of it, however, is this other object here. It's called a quasar. It has a very large redshift, redshift of two. And according to the Hubble law, that should be right on the edge of the visible universe. That should be rushing away from us at nearly the speed of light. But it's clearly in front of this galaxy. This is an active disturbed galaxy. And it looks like, in fact, that this object here, this quasar, this quasar object is being ejected from that galaxy, from the, the, the nucleus of that galaxy. It's being ejected toward us. In fact, if you look at the spectral signature of this gas, it's blue shifted. So any, anyone in the audience who understands this will realize that gas is moving towards the observer, which is us. So that object, which is a massive object, is thrown toward us. Now there's a lot of evidence. In fact, there's an astronomer called Alton Arp who has compiled an enormous amount of evidence where he has seen this sort of phenomenon many, many times. But you see, there's a problem for the Big Bang. Number one, the redshift of the quasar doesn't put it at the edge of the universe where they say it should be. So therefore, this concept of homogeneity is also broken down. Number two, the Big Bang says that all matter, all matter was created at the, at the Big Bang. Galaxies were formed soon after the Big Bang. But Alton Arp and, and others who have made these observations for many years are suggesting this ejection process is ejection of baby galaxies from active galaxies. So we see in the creation process, in my interpretation of this, not Alton Arps, I'm interpreting this within my biblical worldview, that we are actually seeing the creation as it happens. We are looking back in time into creation day four, where God created the stars and galaxies, but we are seeing some of the hand of God as he's ejecting galaxies from galaxies in his creation process. So it didn't all happen at once, happened over that day, over that period of time, which in astronomical time is billions of years. This article appears in a recent creation magazine. 
that I'll tell you a bit more about, but you will find copies of this magazine up there on the book table. And here's another example of this. This one is a galaxy named after Alton Arp himself. It's an elliptical galaxy that has a low redshift, and there's even a high redshift quasar here. I haven't told you what quasars are because really we don't know, but they are massive objects that Alton Arp has documented a lot of evidence that over a period of time they, they age or change or um, become more like normal galaxies. So they get ejected from a parent galaxy and then over a progressive period of time become like normal galaxies. You see where these arrows are, these white arrows, it looks like there's small baby galaxies being thrown out of these parent galaxies here. And there's a lot of that documented in this DVD, Hubble, Bubble, Big Bang in Trouble. And that's available up there on the book tables. And I d document many examples of this and explain redshifts and so on. So I strongly recommend that you, if you're interested in this, get yourself a copy. You see, I think we are seeing the creative hand of God as he's performing his creation on day four. And this fits this timeline that I explained to you earlier, this creationist account, that we are looking back in time into creation week and we can see these things happen because of that time dilation event that I mentioned. So why reject the Big Bang? Well, the first thing to remember, it's really a battle between world views. The Big Bang, the humanistic worldview, and the biblical, the Christian worldview. It's not about science. It's not about the facts. We all have the same facts, the same observations. And it's certainly not about science versus religion, or who has the best evidence, or something like that. The Big Bang, however, if we give it all of its assumptions and we look at the many problems that it has, which I haven't gone into here tonight, it simply doesn't work. And that's obviously a major problem. The second thing is, if you take out all those stars and galaxies, which still the Big Bang uh, astrophysicist, the naturalistic uh, scientist has no idea how they formed naturalistically, then you don't have much left. You think of it, take the stars and galaxies out of the universe and you only have an expanding ball of gas. That's all you've got left. And so that's what it can explain. The Bible tells us, however, God created this world and the universe, according to earth clocks anyway, 6,000 years ago. And if you can't trust what the Bible has to say about, its, about history, then how can you trust what it has to say about everything else? The moral issues, salvation, and so on. God tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Now, I'm not suggesting you don't use your mind and try and inquire and discover the truth of his wonderful creation. We certainly need to do that, but we need to stick with the history that God has given us in the Bible. I certainly do. And for this reason, Alex Williams and I have written this book because we want to try to um, break down the Big Bang, the problems with the Big Bang, and explain to you these issues. But also, most, of, most importantly, to explain to you that you can trust in the history given in his word in Genesis chapter 1 and through right through the whole history given in the Bible. And you're lucky tonight. Make sure you get a copy, only 140 rand, and you notice there's actually one of the authors is in the room today, and you can get him to sign it for you. And if you're not sure who that is, it's me up here. <laughs> but not only that, wait, wait, haven't finished yet. If you get Hubble Bubble Big Bang and Trouble DVD with it, we'll give you a discount, only 190 rand the two. Now that's a real deal, isn't it? So don't rush the tables later, but that's a great deal. I like this verse, and I think this really applies to us all in our life. I paraphrase it, we demolish Big Bang arguments and every pretension or cosmology that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make obedient to Christ. I say that's what we need to do. Begin with the Bible, begin with the Word of God, and it should flow from there. 
Whatever our theories, our cosmology, our ideas about the history of this universe, it must be consistent with the word of God. And that's what I really would like to do and attempt, and I do attempt to do. But to help you do that yourself, to help you to answer those skeptics and those truth seekers in the world, Creation Ministries has produced this creation magazine. It's produced in Brisbane and it answers a lot of the up-to-date questions. It keeps you in touch with everything that is relevant. This is one example here from December 2006 when NASA sent up a satellite to this Temple One comet and they shot a, something like a copper bullet into that, co into that comet, into the surface of the nucleus of the comet and ejecta came out of it. And in the ejecta were things like carbonates, clays and limestone. Where does that sort of stuff form? Only underwater. How can the Big Bang cosmology, this one I showed you, how can that explain the formation of these icy objects out in uh, the outer solar system with materials like clays and so on formed underwater? It can't. It's a big problem. But the biblical account, if you remember, starts with water, starts with a ball of water, God separating the water. Some of the water then may be out in the outer solar system. They tell us that the trans-Neptunian objects, all the stuff past Neptune, has a lot of water ice in it, sometimes 50%. There's things like uh, ammonia and methane and so on, but comets themselves are largely dirty ice balls. There's tons of water out there, water ice. That's consistent with the creation account. So we'd like to give you an opportunity to sign up for this magazine. It comes out four times a year, 56 pages. It's full color. There's no advertising in it. It's fully paid for by subscription. There's a children's section and all. It's written for the layman, for you. But before we uh, pass out these clipboards in a minute, I'd like to read you this. This is from Patrick. He said... I wish to thank you for helping me to prove to my stubborn self that there certainly is a God. Your creation magazine gave me the scientific and spiritual evidence I needed to firmly assure myself that my suspicions were true. At first I shunned the belief of my parents, but after living on my own for two years, with the aid of a copy of your magazine, which I was given one day, someone gave him a copy, I realized that I was the one who was wrong and I asked for salvation. You can use this magazine as a witnessing tool. It brings fruit. Here's uh, Rebecca. She says, the magazine Creation is the most educational and inspiring magazine I've ever had the pleasure to read. I am 99 years old. I preach to people with your magazine. Anyone over 99, put your hand up. <laughs> I'm sorry. No one's off the hook. So it's a great magazine to use. Someone else says, the best equipping tool I've ever seen. Uh, one year, it's 160 Rand, and you get a free back issue. That's if you sign up and pay today. And for three years, uh, 420 Rand. But not only that, you get a free DVD if you get for three years. So that's a deal. There's another deal for you. There is a whole range of DVDs you may have seen up there that are being produced by Creation Ministries. This one is on creation evangelism. How to use the creation story as part of your uh, witnessing. It's a very effective method because it, it really disables people. It takes them right back to their origins. The subject of UFOs and aliens is a very relevant topic to Christians. And I'll talk a bit about that more. Actually, Gary Bates who produced this, uh, this DVD. He's coming here in September, uh, later on in the year. Um, biblical geology. How to understand the age of these rocks that they claim are billions of years old. This is by Dr. Taz Walker. So there's many types of DVDs up there. Um, possibly one of the best resources, the Creation Answers book that answers 60 of the most asked questions in this ministry, in the creation evolution debate. Questions like, who was Cain's wife? Where did Cain get his wife from? You know, there was Cain and Abel, right? Cain killed Abel, correct? Then it says Cain took a wife and had children. Where did Cain get his wife? And I tell you this because I remember when I was about eight years old, and I don't remember much from that part of my life, 
But I do remember my father saying to my mother, where did Cain get his wife from? And you know, my father took that very seriously because the church Christians he spoke to anyway could not answer that question. He viewed the Bible as therefore must be something wrong with it. It must, the Bible must be wrong. And because of that, my father rejected the church, never became a Christian. He's still alive, thankfully, 77, and I've got a chance still. I've given him this book, but it's an important issue that we need to understand these issues. So if you don't know the answer to that question and you want to know, get a copy of the book up the back there from the book tables. And why is there death and suffering in this world? I reckon that's probably also one of the biggest questions you get hit with. You know, they, people say to us, they say, well, if God is a loving God, why do bad things happen to good people, right? You get that hit a lot, right? Do you, do you guys know this guy, Steve Irwin? This crazy crocodile hunter, this Australian guy? Last year he got stabbed through the heart with that stingray's barb. He was... Yeah, he was a crazy guy, but he was a good guy. I mean, he was trying to bring a high profile to protecting uh, uh, nature and animals and so on. Why do these things happen? Well, the world is not the same world that God originally created. We live now in this sin-cursed world, and the curse has affected the whole creation. We need to see the world through this Christian worldview. We need to see it in a different way. We need to see it through the creation account and then the corruption, the curse that resulted from Adam's sin. And, the ultimate, and then the catastrophe of Noah's flood that wiped out everything and laid down all those fossil uh, bearing sediments. Thousands of meters of those sediments, a flood that covered the entire earth. It certainly can explain that very simply. And then the confusion of languages, where God separated the languages at the Tower of Babel and people groups moved all over the earth. And we have different language groups across the globe today. You know, did, is anyone here not married to a relative? <laughs> Put your hand up if you're not married to a relative. Good, I'm glad to see that because we're all from Adam and Eve. If you didn't marry your relative, you didn't marry a human being. <laughs> and it's important to know this because Jesus Christ is the kinsman redeemer. He can only redeem the sons of Adam. See, it doesn't make any sense if we say we evolved some, some past ape-like ancestor through some you know, story that they tell us, this Big Bang story. Anyway, then Christ came and he died and he paid that price. He redeemed us, he paid that penalty for sin. And ultimately, we see this new heaven and new earth that God will restore all things. And we look forward to that. But we need to stay busy on earth while we're here. Okay? To, um, I'd like to mention that I have a new book that's under production right now. It's all written. It's being laid out and it will be published by September this year. And it's Starlight Time and the New Physics and explains the mechanism of this time dilation process that I've been talking about, sort of waving my hands up here. If you really would like to get into the details of this book, the first half is written for the layman, and the second half is all the technical issues, all the general relativistic <coughs> equations, the works in the back of the book. And that should be out soon, soon so keep an eye on the web page, and that will be uh, up front of our web page when it comes out. We have another book out there on Taking Back Astronomy by Jason Lyle. It's an excellent book for the layman, fully illustrated. Really, I, I, fully, I strongly recommend that one if you're interested in that. F Refuting Compromise is an excellent resource. It covers all of those compromise positions that I showed you earlier. In particular, the uh, progressive creationism of Dr. Hugh Ross. It has a whole chapter on problems with the Big Bang. So that's really an excellent resource also. I need to tell you a testimony. That's what my note is for. Anyone know Batak? Anyone speak Batak? No? <laughs> Bataks are people who live in Indonesia, and it's a state of Indonesia. Last year I was at a, an Indonesian church in Perth, and a pastor was telling me a story that... He's telling me about what's happened to his people. 
For hundreds of years, Bataks have been staunchly Christian, evangelical Christians, very, very strong. But because in the last few decades, evolution has been taught in schools in their, in their uh, province of Indonesia, the young people have started to turn away from the Lord and the church. They're becoming very weak Christians. As a result, however, the Muslim missionaries have gone into those areas and they are saying, become a Muslim. They give them absolute standards to live by and they're converting to Islam. And this is the first time in the history of, like, of recorded history that these people have become uh, Muslims. You see, the thing is, what happens when evolution enters the thinking? It undermines the foundation of the church. And we want to help you um, take these issues on board. And so we're providing a range of uh, discounts. We, you, um, we provide these books like Refuting Evolution, The Lie. The Lie by Ken Ham covers all this issue to do with the relevance to Christians. A number of the issues I've covered tonight in terms of the relevance issue. And you can get them at 30% discount by buying them in a pack. And then there's the basic pack, which takes that introductory pack and adds a few resources. The Great Dinosaur Mystery documents recent history of dinosaur li living with man. Because the dinosaurs were created in the Garden of Eden, therefore the dinosaurs went on the ark and came off the ark. Therefore there must be records in past history where man and dinosaur have lived or fought each other. Like King George and the Dragon, for example. But there are many stories that are based on real history. And have a look at that book. Why Won't They Listen is another very good resource and it will help you uh, in, in using this message in your witnessing, helping to understand while people are being turned off through this so-called modern science. They're tuning out because they say the Bible is no longer relevant. And how about this? teacher says to his students, now students, hydrogen is a gas, which if left long enough, turns into people. <laughs> it's true though, isn't it? Remember I told you the history of the Big Bang? It starts out as hydrogen, and over that billions of years of history, eventually through stars and dust, earth, evolution, and you get people. Then if this is true, and we hear all these stories about extraterrestrials and so on, but these concepts are predicated on the notion that evolution, if it's occurred once on Earth, evolution could occur elsewhere in the universe. That aliens, intelligent beings of some other kind, could have evolved on some planets around some other stars in our galaxy or in the universe. And so this leads to these sort of questions. Is there life on other planets? And what about these UFO sightings in every country of the world? This is actually not something to be dismissed because there's a small portion, 10% or something, that actually cannot be explained by natural phenomena. And it is an important issue that Christians need to address. And what about government cover-ups and Roswell and things like this? Alien abductions is a serious issue. Now, if I tell you this, you might laugh, but 3% of US Americans surveyed in Gallup polls have said that they have been abducted by aliens. That's about 9 million people, based on that statistic. And I would add that no one's ever brought back an ashtray or anything like that either. <laughs> and then suicide cults. You remember that, the Heaven's Gate? There was about 30 of them committed suicide because they said there was a UFO coming in by behind the hale -Bopp comet. And they thought somehow that they would get into that, that, um, that spacecraft. It's a serious issue that we need to understand. And probably the best resource is this book, Alien Intrusion, written by my friend Gary Bates. And um, he covers all of these issues. He takes you through all the physical realm right through into the spiritual. Really, I think every Christian should read this book. And I, I know I'm out of time, but I hope you can forgive me. I've got to tell you this story about my son. I have a lot of children, as I don't know if you know, I have um, eight children. And... Um, one of them, my oldest son, in his teen years, he sort of strayed and rebelled away from the Lord. 
When, uh, a couple of years ago when this book came out, he was working in Japan for a friend of mine, and it, um, he was about 22 or something like that. I sent him the book because I knew he'd be interested in this subject. I sent it to him a couple of weeks after he called me, he had read the book, and I got one of these phone calls, 11 o'clock at night. Now I know every parent here knows and dreads the 11 o'clock phone call. But I picked up the phone and he said, Dad, how do I know that I'm saved? You know, he didn't even say hello. <laughs> and he went on to say that this book so moved him, even scared him in a way, he wanted to understand his salvation. And his daughter, my granddaughter, at the time was only 10 months old, and he said, Dad, I want to make sure my daughter becomes a Christian. This book so challenged him to this point in his life. And by God's plan or coincidence, call it what you like, I was going to Japan only a couple of weeks after that because I did a lot of work up there building clocks with the Japanese government agencies. And he said to me, Dad, bring me some books. I don't want the thin little books. I want the big fat ones. I want to really understand this issue. And so I bought a lot of these books from our book table. My church gave me a Bible. My pastor, I told my pastor about it. And I took a lot of material, even stuff from it for um, my granddaughter. We have a lot of children's uh, material. I took it up there, and to cut a long story short, a few months later, back home again, I get another 11 o'clock phone call. I picked up the phone and he said, Dad, you know when we were talking about my salvation before, he said, I now know that I wasn't saved because I have been reading through from Genesis, systematically reading through the Bible, and I understand I am born again. Thank God, he said, I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he come to know Jesus. It changed his life, radically changed his life. Um, I will admit, he's still a work in action, a work in progress, but he is a changed man. In fact, He's so changed, he doesn't understand how people can't see this. And he gets angry with people and tries to, you know, sort of force it on them. But, <laughs> but at least he's changed. He's a changed boy and he loves the Lord now. So I really recommend that to you. It's an excellent resource for anyone sort of on the edge, unsure, not knowing which way to go. If the Creation magazine is not in-depth enough, not, a, not meaty enough, we have the Journal of Creation. It's a peer-reviewed creationist journal that covers all the subjects in the creation debate. I publish material in there myself on cosmology. And in the recent one, I've even published a paper explaining the mechanism of my time dilation process in a five-dimensional universe. Um, you can subscribe to this. The guys up the back at the book table can show you how if you would like to subscribe. But I'd like to leave you with this thought from 1 Peter. I think the most important thing it says, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. I think we all agree to that. But it says also be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have, but to do it with gentleness and with respect. And I think that is the key, that we need to take this message to others and do it in such a way that they can hear us. So thank you very much for listening to me. So I think we're going to have a small Q&A now. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll repeat your question so that everybody can hear. Okay, you're first. How do cosmologists define that concept and what is the life beyond the edge? Okay. So the question is, if I understand it, to, um, to discuss how do you define the edge of the universe? So what I've been showing you about us being at the unique physical centre of the universe could also imply that the universe has an edge, an outer boundary. That would mean the universe is finite. But actually, it could also be infinite, go on forever. Cosmologists, secular cosmologists, reject the notion 
that the universe could be finite, that meaning have an edge. Not finite, finite they don't reject the notion it be finite, but they reject the notion it is finite with an edge. In other words, they believe you could have a finite universe, but it is unbounded. It means it's like the surface of a sphere, like a globe. And I have a slide. The first thing you must realize, the Big Bang community are not saying the Big Bang is an explosion of light, like a bomb, like a matter blowing up, moving through space. What they're saying it is, it is like this girl here. It's imagine it's like the surface of a balloon and galaxies are painted on that surface of the balloon. And as she blows the balloon up, the galaxies all move apart because they, if you think about it, on the surface they would always move apart from each other. And so then they represent the universe at different moments of time by an expanding universe like this. And then at any point on the surface of that, that globe, you can see the galaxies would always move away from each other. So what they're saying then is there's no unique center. You see that? It's finite, but no unique center. And that's what Hubble, Edwin Hubble would refer to in his solution. But also, the solution to Einstein's field equations allows for a unique center and an edge. That is also possible. And in the theory that I have developed, I have found the solution to the field equations permits both solutions. And you cannot distinguish between the two. Only philosophically you could choose a difference. And that's what, going back to what I said earlier, it's really about your belief system. It's about your framework in which you interpret the evidence. But certainly, I believe a finite universe with an edge is consistent with the biblical framework. Because in Psalm 147, I think it is, um, it says God names all the stars and counts them. If you count them, even though the number might be extremely large, it's the same thing as saying it's finite. And when God referred to the uh, Abraham and his offspring that he would have, he said it would be like the sand which is by the seashore and the stars in the heaven. The number of grains of sand on the planet Earth is finite. Might be very large. Apparently someone counted them, 10 to the 80. I don't know what else he had to do, but he was obviously not bothered. Um, <coughs> And it's consistent. Now, I can't prove it, but based on um, various texts, I think it's consistent that we live at the center of a finite, bounded universe, one with an edge, not unbounded, like this, this idea here. Does that answer your question? Next question. Yep. When we see, for instance, this explosion that you showed us, mm. uh, not, not exactly this one, it, it, it said, they say, we are looking what has happened 13, 13 or 7 million years ago. That's right. Uh, I know this is what you are <coughs> trying to explain with the uh, different clocks. Not exactly, no. So it's a different issue. I'll oh, comment on this. You're talking about here the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background recently, um, George Smoot got the Nobel Prize for it. The idea is, and I'll just, I also have some slides for this too. I have lots of slides ready. <laughs> just to educate you all, this is, well, this is not a photograph of the Big Bang, obviously. <laughs> But it's alleged about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, this fireball had expanded out, and matter condensed out of the radiation. Then at that point, radiation was free to move through the universe. They say the universe became transparent, you, like it could pass through the atoms and could travel freely. The universe then expands over these billions of years since the Big Bang, and the radiation is stretched out. The, radi the wavelengths are stretched out and it cools down to the cosmic microwave background radiation that we see around us. They say that this radiation is like the afterglow or echo of that Big Bang fireball. You see the idea? They even say it's a fossil record or something like that. 
In the 1950s, uh, 1955, George Gamow predicted that the temperature of that radiation would be about 5 Kelvin, 5 degrees, minus 270, 68 degrees below zero. And then later in the 60s, he revised his figure up to 50 degrees Kelvin, a bit hotter. Then in 1964, these two guys here, they, using that radio antenna, they, looking up into space in the sky in every direction, they measured this radiation coming in from the cosmos. And of course, they, these guys, Penzias and Wilson, they got the Nobel Prize for that. They measured a temperature of that radiation of about three degrees Kelvin, minus 270 degrees C. So you could say that that was a prediction of the Big Bang model. In fact, it's probably the only prediction of the Big Bang model. However, by the time they made the measurement, um, Gamow had already revised up his number to about 50 Kelvin. Back in the 50s, however, uh, Hoyle, Bondi, and um, what's the other guy's name? The three guys of the steady state theory. They had published papers where they had predicted a, a radiation field, a background radiation field coming from inter, inter, um, intergalactic dust, carbon fiber whiskers. They never calculated the temperature, but they did publish the radiation density. And if you work it out, simple calculation, they, it was about two and a half degrees that they predicted. So it's not just predicted by the Big Bang guys. Technically, it's been predicted by others. So it, just because you predict something doesn't make it so. Anyway, George Smoot got the Nobel Prize for it and John Mathis for the black body spectrum. So two people involved in this. This is the, George Smoot's work, the, um, among others, actually. Um, the WMAP satellite, they measured this temperature across the sky and they extracted these small ripples that they claim are the seeds of the galaxies. This is what you're talking about. This is what they say is that sort of uh, fossil record of that Big Bang fireball. And the dark spots and light spots indicate where galaxies, well, that started the formation of galaxies. But there's some problems with this. One of them is the radiation is only measured by this satellite just near our Earth, one and a half million light years, uh, one and a half million um, kilometers away, not light years, just near, near the Earth. Um, it's not measured way out in the cosmos. It's radiation coming in and we measure it nearby. Some scientists recently have analyzed the radiation coming from the cosmos, this cosmic microwave background radiation, and this is an illustration to explain this. If it came from the Big Bang, the radiation would be coming from the most distant sources in the universe. And if you can imagine this is a cluster of galaxies here, then the radiation coming around the cluster should cast a shadow in the foreground. Because just like if you have a light source and a, an object in front of it, it casts a shadow. Well, this has been analyzed with 32 clusters of galaxies and no shadow was cast. So maybe, in fact, that that cosmic microwave radiation is not actually coming from the background at all. It may, in fact, be a foreground source. This is very large scale here, long way away, but we can't say for certain then that it was necessarily a foreground source. And I don't think we can say it's real evidence for the Big Bang either. Are there any more questions? Yep, up the back. You said that um, if the speed of light was constant, um, couldn't it be that the speed of light varied or could it be um, there's a lot of problems with the speed of light varying. Um, some secular physicists today um, sort of postulate speed of light changing, but a long time in the early universe, um, and only by very small amounts compared to uh, what we could observe today anyway. Um, maybe the larger, I mean, there are some suggestions of um, very superluminal, much, much faster than um, speed of light, but happening in periods that we are not able to observe. In recent times, um, there has been people, uh, even a creationist, who suggested the speed of light had slowed down from an enormous numbers 
down to the constant value it is today. But really there's no evidence for it. There's, um, if you look into space, you see um, light coming from the distant cosmos. If the speed of light had changed, there would be evidence in the light. There would be evidence in the, um, the structure, the fine structure we see in the spectra and things like this. And um, you might know of Barry Setterfield. Do you know of Barry Setterfield? Some years ago he had made this claim, but he based it on a few of the early measurements of the speed of light from Roma in 1670, I think another one in 1825, where the uh, errors in the, the measurements were very large. And I think it's, um, um, there's really no substantive evidence to think otherwise. And that's why I say I believe it's constant. In my own experiments, we measure the speed of light all the time to 16 decimal places, and it's constant. Certainly, it, it's really constant now. And we have very good clocks, too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This is a question, maybe. Um, you've spoken a lot about where the world comes from and where the world comes from. Yeah. And just a biblical perspective of where the world's going to is coming. And mm. um, I've I always understood it to be something, uh, the new heavens and the new earth being something perhaps somewhere else. Uh, but it, it seems to me more and more that it will be this world recreated because it's so unique. Because in everything that's happening in the world, people are looking for another world. Of all of you said, and all the space that's been measured with whatever we have today, it's pretty much unlikely, in, in, in fact, it's probably impossible that there would be another Earth ever to be found. Yeah. Similar. Would that be a, a, the right concept of understanding the new heavens and the new Earth, that it would be this Earth in yeah. this planet form created by God okay. or recreated? Uh, okay. So he's asked. So that's a really long question, but in, in, <laughs> in brief, he's asking me about the new heaven and the new earth. And in my, my view, I think it's consistent with what I've shared tonight that, that we will have a new heaven completely, that God will wipe away all the heavens we see and create a new earth. And so I think it's very good what you're saying there about it being consistent that we're at the center of that, that God would create this the earth at the center of this universe. In this, right, you understand what I'm saying? But, and there's a real problem for extraterrestrials in that as well. Because you think about that for a moment. Jesus is the kinsman redeemer, can only redeem the sons of Adam. Adam sinned and therefore Jesus died and can redeem us. If aliens evolved on other planets and other star systems, they're merrily on a Saturday afternoon, having a barbecue, you call a briar, I think, here. <laughs> and they got a bit of something on the barbecue, because I don't know what they eat on this planet. And this comes to the point where God remakes the heaven. And can you imagine then suddenly the entire planet is wiped out, and they're obliterated, and they didn't do anything. But they couldn't be redeemed by the Savior, because he can only redeem the sons of Adam. So it makes no sense to have extraterrestrial life. Now, if they find bugs on Mars or on Venus or somewhere, that doesn't bother me. And it's certainly not contrary to Scripture, as some scientists think, ah, life found on Mars, the Bible is wrong. That's rubbish. It doesn't make any sense. But it certainly makes sense to me in that sort of big picture that the whole focus of God's attention is on this planet, and therefore the, the new heaven, the kingdom to come, will be here at the center of this universe. And maybe he'll give us all a galaxy each or something, you know, I don't know. 10 to the 22 galaxies, is it? Something like that? I'm sure that's plenty for all of us. Any more or are we finished? Last one, last one over there. What does dark matter? Mm. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. What is dark matter? Okay, we are told it's amazing the slides I have here ready, you know. <laughs> you think I've uh, heard these questions before. We are told that the current universe is made up of 74% dark energy, 22% dark matter, and 4% normal atoms. This stuff, protons, electrons, are things that you and I are made of. That we don't argue with. We can pretty much determine that sort of stuff. They require another 22% of dark matter and then there's this other thing of about 74% dark energy. Well, let me tell you just something where some of this stuff comes from. 
When you make measurements and test your cosmological theories in the universe, you have to be able to measure something. And the idea is you want to measure the distance to very distant galaxies in the universe, certainly on this large scale measurements. The idea is you need a standard light bulb. And you all know that if you take a standard light bulb and move it away uh, twice the distance, the luminosity, the brightness, drops by the square. Right? It goes inverse square law of illumination. You learnt that in physics in high school. Everyone remember that? And, and if you don't, you know that the headlights coming toward you at 100 kilometres an hour are close when they're bright. So get over the other side of the road. <laughs> When they're dim, you're OK. It's further away. You all know that intuitively. So astronomers, they look in the cosmos for what they would call a standard candle. And they have found a type of supernova, an exploding star. So, see this in 1995? There's no red dot there. But over here in the same image, that one there, no red dot. There's a red dot. That's an exploding star. That was taken in 2002. That's an exploding star. and they're, they they outshine the brightness of their host galaxies by many orders of magnitude for a, for a very short period of time. So they're brilliantly bright, enormously bright, and they can be used as one of those standard light bulbs to measure the distance of the host galaxy in the universe. And astronomers have used them, and they've been able to find collections of them of certain types that they can calibrate to the same brightness. And therefore, they can test their theories to see whether they're the equations, that friedman lamarck equation that you all have the homework to work on, is correct or not. All right? In so doing, to make it fit the standard Friedman model, which is the Big Bang model, they have to invent 22% dark matter and 74% dark energy. This is stuff you cannot see, and yet it's supposed to be all around us here today. You see where this, le this comes from? But the dark matter also comes in in other places, in the galaxies, the rotation of uh, the, the stars in, in spiral galaxies. They have to invent halo dark matter. And I'll just tell you one story to give you a little perspective on this. In the late 1900s, uh, astronomers noticed that the planet Mercury, when it moved around on its axis, it rotated a little bit, like a rosetta. It didn't retrace its path each time it come round. And they did their calculations using Newtonian physics, and there was an anomalous amount of rotation. Very small amount, 43 arc seconds, absolutely tiny. This is amount per century, per 100 years. But they were really worried by this. And so they proposed dark matter was the reason, was the solution. Matter that you can't see. And at the time, one of the popular theories was the planet Vulcan. Vulcan was in behind the sun. And every time the Earth moved around the sun, Vulcan hid behind it. So you could never see it. Always hidden behind the sun, therefore dark, unobservable. Actually, Spock is not from that Vulcan, because I looked it up on the internet, and he's as light, 14, 16 light years away. Wasn't the one behind the sun. But they call that planet Vulcan. They also suggested there was an asteroid belt inside the planet, inside Mercury's orbit, a belt you couldn't see. They call that dark matter. So whenever astronomers can't explain something in the universe, can't explain the dynamics, they invoke dark matter. And nowadays, they have invoked this other stuff, this force, dark energy, that gives them all this extra kick to make the universe accelerate apart. It could be that their model is wrong, and they don't need this sort of stuff. Well, I would add here, and if you get my new book coming out in a few months, it's all in the book, uh, my model, my cosmology, explains the dynamics of the universe with only the 4% matter. No dark matter, no dark energy. It's, I think, a fudge factor. Kind of reminds me of that story of the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> Everyone's talking about it, but it just ain't there. I think we've run out of time, and thank you very much.